Welcome to Cool Talk. Today we examine the history of Christianity. Now keep in mind this is not a theocratic video. It's a historical video so we're not here to argue about a belief system. Now most modern scholars, including many atheists, believe that Jesus did exist. Now before we get into the history, let's touch on the evidence. The canonical gospels, for the most part, follow the same storyline. And there are many other gospels that are not canonical and are not in the Bible. Now this doesn't prove anything, but it does raise the issue that if there are many writings about one man, that would point at his probable existence. The Roman historian Tacitus, in his annals, wrote of Jesus' execution by Pilate and the existence of early Christians in Rome. Now there is one problem. His writings show possible tampering. For example, Pilate was called the procurator and not the prefect. But Tacitus, who hated Christians, will habitually check sources before writing about them. And he was also an expert on foreign religions in Rome. Pliny the Younger, the magistrate, and Suetonius, the historian, also write of early Christians. Flavius Josephus wrote the Antiquities of the Jesus, which refers to Jesus and John the Baptist and James, the brother of Jesus, and his death. Now again, his use of the word Messiah means that his writings were probably tampered with, but nevertheless, scholars agree that it's authentic. In any case, it points to the existence of Jesus. He mentions James, the brother of Jesus, executed and differs with the Gospels in other areas, saying that Herod executed John the Baptist to avoid an uprising. Now he does mention that in prison John the Baptist was in was in Macherius, and there was a conflict that Herod had with Aretas IV. This is consistent with the time of Herod's marriage, which is mentioned in the Gospels. Mara Bar Serapion, a Syrian philosopher, mentions three outstanding men who were unjustly punished. One was Socrates, the second Pythagoras, and the third was mentioned as the King of the Jews. He did not mention Jesus by name. The Babylonian Talmud accuses Jesus of sorcery, treating him as an existent person. Eusebius wrote of a solar eclipse, but not an earthquake during the Passion. Now, was there an earthquake during the Passion? Yes, in Turkey, but in November of 29 AD. Now, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, many annals, chronicles, and records were destroyed by fire. Now, that does not prove anything, but it also proves that a lot of records are missing one way or the other. Then there's the issue of the martyrs. A lot of people died in the name of Jesus. That's a lot of things that have happened to, to say that it happened for the name of a person who did not exist. It points to his existence. Now, we could go on and on, but let's just say that modern scholars agree of the existence of historical Jesus and move on. Jesus was born a Jew, and Jews for thousands of years practiced monotheism, the belief in one God, that God always existed, that there was no beginning, that he was personally involved in people's history, and that he demanded moral righteousness, and from this came Mosaic law, that God had a covenant with his chosen people, the Jews. There were rules to follow, and he demanded circumcision. Now, the Roman Empire absorbed the Jewish homeland, the province of Judea, they put oppressive leaders to control the people, such as Herod. Romans also brought Greek language and Hellenistic rationalism. Now, the Jewish leaders hated this and wanted to go back to the old ways. These Jewish leaders were the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Zealots. And into this scenario was born Jesus. When was he born? Probably 4 BCE. Now, the Gospels say he was born in Bethlehem at the time of Herod the Great, and they cite family lineage. Now, Gospels mention the massacre of the baby boys in Bethlehem, but there's no mention of this massacre anywhere else. However, Bethlehem was small, and it also fits Herod's temperament. Now, in the Bible, Luke 2, 1-3 mentions a census of Quirinius under the orders of Caesar Augustus in Judea, that there was a census that would be taken and that Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem for that census. Now, there is record of a census. You can look it up. But there's no practical need of uprooting everybody to go to their birthplace. People could not trace their lineage 42 generations either. Anyway, I'm just pointing that out.
His Hebrew name was Yeshua, and he was known as the son of Mary instead of the son of Joseph, indicating that his father had died or minimizing Joseph's parental role in the Gospels. Jesus began preaching love and forgiveness, peace and emphasis on the afterlife, and he agreed with Jewish leaders to return to early Jewish teachings, but he tempered this with love, and he took a hard stance against the rich and clerical leaders. The meek shall inherit the earth. Now the poor just ate this up. This was great, but it was this anti-authority stance that got him in trouble. Jesus called the Pharisees vipers, snakes, rotting corpses in elegant tombs, arrogant, haughty. He debated them and he won every argument and Jesus was highly charismatic and the number of followers grew. Now, many believed him to be the foretold savior, the Messiah, and since timing is everything, Jews were especially keen on the approaching savior since it was a time of Roman oppression. Some false messiahs had come and gone. Could this Jesus be the one? Now, there was a cult at the time for the late Caesar Augustus, who was called, get this, Son of God, Savior of the world. Now, why didn't this cult catch on? Well, the Romans were pretty bad to the Jews, and they would later destroy their temple and exile them. At any rate, the Gospels state that Jesus was arrested, executed by crucifixion, rose from the dead three days later, and soon ascended into heaven. So now his followers, in what would be called at the time a so-called Jewish sect, began to preach that Jesus would return and bring salvation to sinners. It was slow but steady progress, but it appealed to all. Judaism was a bit more exclusive. If you wanted to convert to Judaism, you, if you were a male, you had to be circumcised. No anesthesia, and then you had to follow a strict dietary law. Christianity was more inclusive, as we shall see. The followers were led by Simon Peter, one of Jesus' first disciples. He had strong leadership qualities, but then the persecution began. The Apostle Stephen was put in charge of distributing food to the poor. He was confronted by members of the synagogue. He got into a debate with them, won, but then he was dragged before the Sanhedrin, gives a long speech which is detailed in Acts chapter 7. But the crowd turned on him, dragged them outside the city, and threw him to the ground. Stephen prayed out loud for them. Now some men took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a man called Saul of Tarsus. He was notorious for persecuting Christians. Then the men picked up rocks and stoned Stephen to death. Soon afterwards, James was also executed, some say by the orders of Herod Agrippa. Now Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians, but he had a vision, saw Jesus' apparition, and went temporarily blind, and for the rest of his life, he preached about Jesus. He changed his name to Paul and said, My name is Paul, and that's between y'all. Meanwhile, Peter had a dream of his own, a vision that convinced him that Christians didn't have to follow the strict dietary laws. And he began to preach the Gentiles, that is, non-Jews. This began with the baptism of a centurion named Cornelius, who began speaking in tongues, amazing everybody. A non-Jew, a non-circumcised, pork-eating Roman had become a Christian. Now, Paul was a tent maker, but he was very educated, having studied under the Rabbi Gamaliel in Jerusalem. He traveled far and wide through Asia Minor, Greece, Syria, Palestine. He was very successful with the Gentiles, and being a Roman citizen allowed him to travel through the Mediterranean. He preached about original sin, you know, Adam and Eve and all of that, but the Jewish leaders of the time didn't emphasize this so much. So most of the population, which was illiterate and had little access to the ancient book of Genesis, didn't know much about it. Now, Paul wrote extensively. He traveled tirelessly. Fourteen books of the New Testament were written by him. A theology states that the original sin of Adam and Eve, that Jesus died for our sins, to accept Christ, sins are forgiven, go out, preach, and do good. As persecution intensified, Christians began hiding behind this symbol. They would put it on doors and go behind it. And this symbol, of course, is a fish, and it comes from the word ichthys, I-C-H-T-Y. S. And uh, the acronym is I-X-O-Y-E, which means Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. All of this hidden behind the word fish. And I'm sure that you saw the fish symbol here and there on different bumper stickers today. Emperor Nero would tie up poor Christians on poles, set them on fire, and light up the streets at night. There were there were stonings and torture, and it's said that Peter and Paul were executed around this time. In the year 70 AD, Jerusalem was attacked by the Romans who took over, the temple was destroyed, and the Jews were kicked out. 
The Christians, uh, they started preaching underground, and you probably heard stories of how they were fed to lions inside the Colosseum. By this point, the remaining early followers began writing of Jesus. Now, they probably hadn't done it before, thinking that Jesus would come earlier. But at this point, they began writing it all down, and there were many Gospels, but only four were canonical. Through the centuries, Christianity grew. Soon there was a hierarchy. Overseers, later called bishops. Elders, later called priests. Deacons, later called servants. There were jurisdictions, congregations, different sections, and many, many bishops. Now, the Bishop of Rome, this one right over here is Linus. Now, he's considered the second Bishop of Rome. The first one being considered Peter as the first Bishop of Rome. Considered the first Bishop by the Catholics, who look at him as the first Pope. Now, many anti-Catholics would say that Peter never went to Rome, but some sources say that he did. I'll let you do the research. Nevertheless, Rome became the center point and the Council of 56 AD was centered there. Now, as Christianity grew, so did conflict. There were Hebrew Christians that were different from Hellenistic Christians, Jewish Christians different from the Greek Christians, Aramaic language versus the Greek language. Then the argument came of the divinity of Christ. Was he divine? Was he God himself? This brought Arianism that said that no, that Jesus was God's begotten son. Then there were Trinitarianism, which meant that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were one and the same and saying that if Jesus was the begotten son, then um, he would not be there since the beginning as the Bible claims. So they say that Jesus transcended out of God. Anyway, they couldn't come to a decision. There was also docetism, which is Jesus' humanity being just an illusion. And there's a duality of Jesus. Could he be fully human and fully God? How is this possible? Even the 20th century book and film, Last Temptation of Christ, tries to explain this premise. Then in 311 AD, Emperor Galerius signed an edict banning the persecution of Christians, giving them a much needed breather. He was followed by Constantine I, who became a Christian and made Christianity a state religion. He built basilicas, churches, gave tax exemption to the churches, supported church financially, built a new Eastern Roman capital, Constantinople, named after himself. Not very Christian, but hey, whatever. Constantine started the precedent that the emperor was responsible for the spiritual health of his subjects. There were no pagan temples allowed in Constantinople. Then in 318 AD, Constant Constantine was tired of the different views and doctrines, so he called for the Council of Nicaea, presided over by himself. They developed a uniform doctrine called the Nicene Creed. They discussed the nature of Jesus. Was he begotten by God and did he have a beginning or was he God himself? They decided for the tri... Uh, Trinitarianism, meaning that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were one. They discuss eunuchs. Could a eunuch become a priest? Well, if he was castrated by a barbarian or by accident, yes, he could be a priest. But if it was self-inflicted, no. Now, believe it or not, self-castration for God actually occurred. And henceforth, mutilation of the body is a sin. Today, we call it a sign of mental illness. They discussed kneeling and baptism and lapsed Christians. They also discuss which New Testament books would be accepted. Now, today's Bible has four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the others that were not accepted were Gospels by Mary Magdalene, Judas, Thomas, Peter. They're considered the Apocrypha. Now, there was one book that was at first accepted but then rejected. It was uh, the Codus Sinaiticus. was a Bible that you can still see in the British Museum. And there was a book called The Shepherd of Hermes. Now, Hermes was a former slave who claimed that Jesus was a mere mortal, but so virtuous and so filled with the Spirit that he was adopted as a son of God. This was later pulled out. Now, how did these men choose what to put in and what to take out? Well, they got authorized, educated, reliable individuals. They wanted the message to coincide with the primary sources, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and define the boundaries of interpretation. Well, now with the emperor's blessings and his method of forced conversion, Christianity spread like wildfire. There were some negatives, though. Once Rome adopted Christianity, technology and science would decline, would remain stagnant, and would stay so until the Renaissance. There lived Augustine, a Roman African who became Bishop of Hippo, a philosopher who had profound effect on the church's thinking. There still survives 1,200 letters of his plus 500 sermons. Augustine wrote of the original sin. He emphasized on this. He solidified the points, including excommunication. He believed in predestination. Now, a British theologian named Pelagius disagreed with the church's view on original sin. Well, he was exiled to Egypt and never heard from again. And when the Visigoths 
sacked Rome in 410, many thought that this was punishment from God. Well, Augustine disagreed. He said that there's no city more important than the city of heaven. So by consequence, no emperor was more important than the Pope or the church. Now, Augustine confessed to struggling with temptation and sexual urges, even paralleling original sin with sexual desire. This changed medieval thinking at the time and gave many millions of people lots of sexual guilt ever since. In 380 AD, Emperor Theodius I declared that anybody who did not believe in the church's traditions would be a heretic. Five years later, the Bishop of Avila was executed, burned to death. His name was Priscillian. What was his crime? Well, he says that you could take the Eucharist, the communion home, and that it was okay for men to pray with women. He was the first official execution of the church. Nestorius and his followers believed that Mary was the mother of Jesus, but not the mother of God. Well, the emperor Theodius says, she is the mother of God. You better get out of here. So Nestorius and his followers ran off to Persia, where they started the Church of the East. And other groups split away as well to form Oriental Orthodoxy. This happened in Armenia, Syria, and Egypt. Monasteries and nunneries sprang up all over Europe as many people would renounce worldly pursuits and to live like hermits or be part of a group of ascetics. By the Middle Ages, the Roman Empire had split in two, the Western Roman Empire and the East Byzantium Empire. As Germanic tribes, barbarians took over country by country in the West, the church had to adapt to new realities, new kings, different views, many pagans. In Gaul, for example, was overrun by Frankish kings, even though they later converted to Roman Catholicism, and the Merovingian dynasty would govern in Gaul for 300 years. In 768 AD, Charlemagne became King of the Franks, King of the Lombards, and Holy Roman Emperor. He fought the Saxons in the East and Muslims. Now, Charlemagne believed that once you were conquered, you had to be converted to Christianity or be killed. This led to the massacre at Verden, where 4,500 Saxons were killed. Now, Charlemagne noticed that many clergymen were uneducated, so he imported educated men from all over Europe to his court. Here's an example about a conflict between church and state. There was a conflict on who should choose bishops. Now keep in mind that bishops collected revenue in their jurisdiction. So kings wanted to name their friends as bishops, but the church said that it alone had the authority to do so. When Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV defied the Pope on this by naming one of his friends a bishop, the Pope excommunicated the king. The king then feared a rebellion by his own people, so he goes to see the pope at Canossa Castle, where the pope was at the time, and Henry IV stayed outside barefoot in a hair shirt, fasting and begging for forgiveness. The pope kept him outside for three days before letting him in, and that night they took communion together. Now, Henry IV had to do this because he feared a rebellion, but the German nobleman assumed that Henry lost his right to govern, and the Pope agreed and sided with the rebels. So Henry IV fought a civil war against the rebels. He won. Then he invaded Rome and drives the Pope out of the city and replaced him with Clement III. Now, Emperor Alexis I writes a letter to Pope Urban requesting help fighting against Islamic forces. He probably expected some mercenaries or money, but instead, Pope Urban, on November 27, 1095 AD, makes a speech calling for knights to make a pilgrimage to free the Holy Land. And if they went, the church would forgive all their sins and that there was also money and booty in the Holy Land that they could partake of. And thus began the Crusades, centuries of attempts, war between the Holy Land and the Crusaders. And great names came up such as Richard the Lionheart and Saladin. Now, one side effect of contacting the Western Europeans with the East European and the Islamic world is that it brought back a lot of influences and culture. And so came the Renaissance. And during all this, we had many artists such as Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, and Donatello. No, not these guys. I meant the real artists, the ones that gave us some of the greatest works that the world has ever seen. And not just art, but advances in science, technology, and medicine. 
And when Christianity reached the Slavic people and the Rus, it brought about the Russian Orthodox Church. But sadly, to suppress heresy came medieval inquisition, centuries of interrogations, false confessions, trials, torture, and burning at the stake, all against false Christians and Jews. Communication between the East and Western parts was so bad, see the East did not see the Pope as infallible. This brought the great schism as Western Catholicism differed from Eastern Orthodoxy. And in 1204, the Roman Catholics went on a crusade to the East, but not to fight the Muslims. They went and invaded and sacked the city of Constantinople and established a Latin Empire to take over. And 800 years later, Pope John Paul II would apologize for this event. In 1337, Hesse Chasm was condemned. Now, Hesse Chasm is a practice of repeating a prayer over and over and over until you're devoid of all your senses and you feel touched by God. Now, though it was condemned, it was later taken up by Catholics and Anglicans. In 1453, Mehmet the Conqueror invaded and took over the last Christian stronghold in Eastern Europe, Constantinople. This was a disaster for Christianity, but also economically, because merchants had to travel through Constantinople to get spices from Asia. So with the Turks blocking the trade route, new methods had to be obtained. So in 1492, Columbus sailed west, trying to find Asia, but instead encountered the Americas, while Vasco da Gama, Portuguese, was the first to sail around Africa and reach India by sea. By this point, the church owned one-third of all the real estate in Europe, and Martin Luther, a German priest, was disgusted with the corruption within the church, especially how church, the church was selling indulgences. Now, an indulgence was basically that you pay the church some money and they absolve you of your sin. So, on October 31st, 1517, at the Church of Wittenberg, Martin Luther nailed 95 theses on the door denouncing the practice of selling indulgences. He also stated that the church did not control us, that we could be guided by the Bible alone, and he translated the first Bible into German. Now, he believed that salvation came from faith alone, but that good works would reflect this. Now, Martin Luther was backed up by the royals, who, who resented sharing their power with the church. Martin Luther was declared a heretic, but he was too popular to burn at the stake. Now, this brought along the Reformation, and various Protestant sects would follow. Martin Luther influenced John Calvin, a Protestant who became a leader of a theocratic government in Geneva, Switzerland, where some sins also became crimes. Adultery, fornication, gambling, drunkenness, dancing, inappropriate songs could land you in jail. You could even be burned at the stake. He believed in predestination, but in, in spite of him being intolerant, ironically, he helped bring in capitalism because he thought it was okay to charge interest for a loan. So along came capitalism and later on democracy. The Americas brought a lot of wealth to Europe, and it also brought millions of new Christian converts. Now, the popes spent lavishly on themselves, but they also beautified the city. Now, St. Peter's Basilica began its construction in 1505, and it would be finished 120 years later. In the 1500s, Henry VIII of England, a Catholic, wanted to get a divorce so he could marry his girlfriend, Anne Boleyn. And, well, the Pope said no, so Henry VIII started his own church, the Church of England. The Catholic Church was losing converts, so they started the Counter-Reformation, where they concentrated on helping the poor and preaching more, and they were very successful. In the 1600s, Galileo was tried for heresy for agreeing with Copernicus that the earth revolved around the sun. Well, hundreds of years later, Pope John Paul II would apologize for this event. Protestants from England went to the New World where they could practice their beliefs. In the 1720s, there was a revivalism that brought the development of Presbyterianism, Baptist, Methodist, and Dutch reforms. The Restoration Movement was a movement to go back and restore early Christian doctrine. This brought us Joseph Smith, who started the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormonism, and Charles Taze Russell, who began the movement of the Jehovah Witnesses. 
In the early 20th century, Russia became the first country to adopt communism and became an atheist state. As the Soviet Union, it cracked down on Christians, especially the Russian Orthodox Church. There were priests arrested, there was torture, prison camps, mental hospitals, labor camps, and execution. Over 12 and a half million Christians were killed. But in 1941, Stalin revived the Russian Orthodox Church because he needed its support in the war effort against Hitler. October 11, 1962, the Second Vatican Council clarified his teachings and for the first time allowed the people to hear the masses in their native languages. Today there are super mega churches, snake handlers, faith healers, televangelists, all kinds of denominations, and some very, very judgmental people. And now with the internet where you can share information, there's been a rise in atheism of all kinds. However, Christians are fighting back. They're using technology too. There are websites, podcasts, Christian dating services, everything you can think of. And let's just say that a third of the world population is Christian, over 2 billion people. It's anybody's guess what direction Christianity takes next. We shall see. In the meantime, my next video will be timelines of history and also some film analysis of movies that I like. But for now, this is Cool Talk. Comment below or better yet, subscribe.